very loud. Hello? We're going to go ahead and get started. Can everyone hear back there? Okay, great. <laughs> but feel free to get up, um, have seconds, grab dessert, grab coffee. We like to keep things a little bit casual. So welcome. For those of you who don't know, my name is Anna Berry. I'm the director of the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. And the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire is a nonpartisan, nonprofit group that's been working since 1954 in the state to promote understanding of world affairs. We have quite a few different programs that we do, and I'll, I'll explain a few that are coming up. One is a free community series on foreign policy that we run at UNH Manchester. The next one is next Tuesday evening. And the series is called Global Tipping Points. We're hosting the former ambassador to the USSR, Jack Matlock, um, who will be talking a little bit about how myths created in the Cold War about America have continued to shape our foreign policy. So um, that's one of the great series that we do each spring. We're also very honored to host Senator George Mitchell, who will be our special guest for the Global Forum on April 23rd. That's a fundraiser to benefit our critical work. Tickets are $50, and we really hope that you'll show up and support us and also learn a little bit about um, one of the world's greatest peacemakers um, as well. And um, we have a special offer for members. If you'd like to join us as a patron, not only will you be supporting us as a patron, have your name in the program, but you'll also be invited to a special meet and greet with Senator Mitchell before the event. So just ask me for details about that or go online. We also host an international visitors program where people from around the world are chosen as emerging leaders and sent to the United States um, to learn more about democracy or nonprofit management, a number of different um, topics and to then bring that knowledge back home to their countries. So just this week, we're hosting visitors from Venezuela who are learning about democracy, emerging leaders from Europe learning about the global economy, um, and visitors from Brazil who are learning about environmental law. We're actually always looking for volunteers to have these visitors in your homes, um, just for dinner or coffee, um, sort of to connect with the world and learn more about a different country. So if you're free March 18th, 19th, or 20th, let us know, and you can host somebody from Brazil, or we also have a group coming from Georgia. They work at universities in Georgia and are learning about how student governments and organizations um, can help be leaders at academic institutions. We'd also like to thank our mission partner, Southern New Hampshire University, for hosting us here on campus and for helping us with our critical work. And I'd like to introduce a few special guests. Um, New Hampshire's very own Africa expert, Ambassador Donald Peterson. Where are you? Here. Oh, there he is. Um, he's been a colleague of Ambassador Conzi's, and he began his diplomatic service in 1961. He served in Liberia, Sudan, Tanzania, Somalia, Liberia, as well as a post as charged affair at the U.S. Embassy in Zimbabwe in the early 90s. So it's a great pleasure to have him here with us today. Um, I'd also like to welcome a personal inspiration of mine, my mother, Jane Haig, <laughs> who is visiting today um, all the way from Alaska, where she is assistant professor of history at Kenai Peninsula College and author of many books on Alaskan history. So now let's turn to Africa and its future challenges and opportunities. It's my great honor to introduce Ambassador Albrecht Kanzi, who's currently a fellow at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. Um, you may not know about the fellowship program, but it was inaugurated in 1958 at Harvard um, with the establishment of the center because of their belief that the center's research activities would benefit from the contributions of non-academic professionals with broad practical experience in international affairs, and that the center could broaden the practitioner's horizons and deepen their understanding of contemporary issues in which they're professionally involved. 
So around 20 people are chosen from all across the globe for this prestigious program every year. Um, for those of you who attend us, attended our last Global Tipping Point session, Michael Fairbanks, who was talking about um, entrepreneurship and ending global poverty, was also a Weatherhead Fellow and a colleague of the Ambassadors. Um, Ambassador Kanzi began his foreign service in Germany in 1981, and his experience on the ground includes three years as Germany's ambassador to Zimbabwe and two years as the ambassador to Benin. Previously, he served in Hong Kong, Beijing, Vienna, Warsaw, Tunis, and Moscow, and his government twice posted him to UN peacekeeping missions in Kosovo and Congo. His education includes a doctorate in international law from Freiburg University. And as you may know, Ambassador Kanzi's own service in, Zimb in Zimbabwe began just after the state's historic election when voters overwhelmingly rejected dictator Robert Mugabe's horrific rule. Yet despite the power sharing agreement Mugabe later signed, violence has continued and Zimbabwe still has one of the highest mortality rates in Africa and one of the highest HIV rates in the world. The ambassador has been described as the diplomat who gave Mugabe hell, but he's here today to talk about Africa as a whole, having spent this academic year at Harvard researching parameters for Africa's political emancipation beyond aid and dependency. It's clearly a large issue to cover in just one hour, but we're thrilled to have him here today to delve into it. Please join me in welcoming the Ambassador to the World Affairs Council. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm extremely pleased uh, to be with you with uh, the New Hampshire Council today. Uh, having become a, a New Englander of choice last August, at least for a year at Harvard, I have come to understand that uh, this state is extremely special once it comes to political awareness and that apparently you are second to none, although some people from the fields in Iowa are trying their best to challenge you. You are second to none uh, when it comes uh, to uh, educating the rest of the nation on what the choices are. Uh, once every four years. Now, you are active and politically active also when this moment has passed, and it has passed for the next four years, of course. So uh, you are active in uh, um, uh, keeping your interest in world politics, and this gives me the opportunity to uh, uh, share with you some of my uh, experiences uh, from seven consecutive years in Africa. Can you hear me well? Is that good enough now? Good. Uh, over the past uh, years, until last June, when I left uh, uh, Harare. Uh, uh, maybe that's better. When I left Harare, uh, and uh, as uh, hell has been mentioned, I think I owe you an explanation. Uh, now, uh, ambassador, an ambassador's task uh, does not usually comprise giving the head of state hell uh, to whom he has presented credentials. I would call this at least unusual. Uh, so uh, the, the story behind is uh, the funeral of Robert Mugabe's sister. Um, that was uh, in August, one and a half years ago. Uh, and uh, I had nothing to do in August. Everything is quiet. My family was away. So for the first time, I decided to positively respond to an invitation by ZANU PF, Robert Mugabe's uh, liberation, so so to say, party, to attend a state funeral, because I thought, well, I have to go once, and uh, so I went there. And apparently, my uh, American colleague uh, was equally bored in August and had also decided to go there out of curiosity. We were the only ones, together with the EU deputy representative, and we were sitting there in a tent and we were listening to uh, Bob. And Bob, as usual. Uh, made his speech in the local language with his Shona uh, for about an hour, and then uh, he turned into English, into the Queen's English. As you know, Robert Mugabe is trying to be more British uh, than the Brits, uh, and um, he always does that when he wants the world to listen. So uh, Charlie and I, my, my American uh, colleague and I, uh, uh, were all uh, up in attention, and then uh, he told the West to go to hell. I have forgotten the reason, but. Uh, uh, he then repeated it in case we hadn't understood. Uh, May they go to hell, to hell, to hell. So Charlie, Charlie was sitting in front of me. I was tapping on his shoulder. I said, I suppose we need to go. So he 
jumped up. I said, no, Charlie, at the end of the speech only. Otherwise, it's, it's too impolite. So two minutes later, uh, this, this English uh, little excurs was finished, and, and Mugabe was done with his speech. And um, the, the two of us, and the European uh, representative looking at us, we said, yes, yes, we come too. The three of us walked out. And um, uh, we then tried to control the media. That was the most interesting thing to do uh, right away, to spin the story in the right way, because we knew what was going to happen. We would be called in. We would be chastised for being impolite and for leaving a funeral out of protocol, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, what we did was to inform the press that uh, we had been told to go to hell. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to find the way, but we couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> and for the rest of, of that story, I think uh, it was uh, uh, a little more to our credit uh, than it was to Robert Mugabe's. <laughs> I'm particularly grateful, let me just say that, to see uh, Donald Peterson again, uh, my American colleague with whom I served for a short while while he was doing an interim in Zimbabwe during my time there. We were sitting together in uh, donors groups and uh, had quite a few good exchanges. So uh, 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 Manchester, New Hampshire is a place where one uh, finds old friends again. That is very reassuring. <laughs> I don't want to speak about Zimbabwe all the time today. In fact, I just want to say a few words at the beginning um, about, uh, about Zimbabwe, uh, about Kenya, about the DRC, uh, three countries where things have gone, have gone wrong lately, uh, before I talk about what uh, seems to be going right in Africa. And uh, my main focus is on uh, rather that second part. But uh, I would not be a credible speaker would I not uh, start uh, with uh, drought, disaster, disease, uh, despair, uh, uh, and uh, displacement, and all these African uh, diseases that uh, uh, our news agencies uh, uh, are always happy to report about? Uh, it is more rare that they would report about something else. So yes, indeed, a lot is wrong with Africa. And if we take Zimbabwe as an example, um, we have uh, all the ingredients uh, there for something to go wrong uh, that was not, and by far not, the worst place in Africa at the moment of independence in 1980. First, independence came late, as in most of southern Africa, where there had been many white settlers. <coughs> independence was a much more difficult thing to achieve than in tropical Africa, where you had had no settlers. They would all <coughs> die of malaria there. So. Uh, uh, administration by both uh, the British and the French was rather light, uh, and uh, settlers uh, did not constitute uh, uh, a group that had to be taken care of. Uh, so uh, Zimbabwe was late in its independence. It had a complex heritage. It had the wrong ruler from the start with outdated ideas, because he was a Marxist, uh, and he uh, took hold of that country nine years before or 10 years before uh, Marxism came to its historic end in the northern part of, uh, of the world. Um, he uh, was intellectually brilliant and uh, managed to outsmart uh, anyone uh, who could come uh, uh, across uh, his way uh, to challenge him, first within his own liberation movement and later with regard to the opposition, Tsvangi Rai and the MDC, the opposition party today, although they ride on a very popular uh, wave of, uh, of uh, oppositional mistrust against uh, uh, the eternal dictator, have not managed uh, to uh, capitalize on their popular support. There is a coalition government, but there is no uh, reflection of the will of the people. The 2008 election, uh, Anna has mentioned that uh, in her introductory words, was stolen by Mugabe, and the international community couldn't do much uh, to prevent that from happening. So uh, the opposition is weak. Uh, help from outside uh, uh, that opposition could hardly get, because the rest of southern Africa uh, is wary of opposition parties. No one of these liberators wants an MDC uh, in their country, neither the ANC in South Africa, nor SWAPO in uh, Namibia, uh, nor uh, Frelimo in Mozambique, uh, nor ML MPLA in Angola. They are all uh, still in the logic of solidarity with the original uh, independent uh, uh, fighters, uh, and Mugabe is one of them. So uh, 
all this leads to the sad conclusion that we will probably have to wait for his death. Uh, whether he goes to heaven or hell is not for me to decide, but uh, uh, it is one of these examples where uh, one shrugs uh, one's shoulders and says, well, will Africa ever get anywhere? So far uh, for Zimbabwe. But once he is gone, there are many conditions in Zimbabwe that could make it possible for that country to turn around rather quickly. The very high level of education of the people, the very active diaspora, some of whom might come back, um, the uh, rather good white-black cooperation, uh, although Z um, Mugabe has always pretended that this was not the case, but uh, in fact they've both suffered over the past 15 years, and uh, uh, race relations are much better in Zimbabwe than they are in South Africa now. Uh, and finally, uh, of course, their enormous riches, commodities uh, under the earth and also uh, tobacco and all sorts of cash crops. Uh, Zimbabwe is a candidate for uh, a sharp rise once uh, the political things, the political issues have been sorted out. Kenya was a, a wonderful example of success for many years, wasn't it? Early independence, uh, a promising start, uh, Kenyatta, one of Africa's icons, um, a clever tourism policy, uh, uh, an intelligent use of Nairobi as the regional hub, also with attracting international business, uh, United Nations agencies, etc. Uh, so uh, Kenya was an attractive country, uh, a country well known all over the world because of uh, the wonderful safaris one could do there, there were nice beaches, etc., etc. But Kenya, all of a sudden, it wasn't all of a sudden, but we saw it as being all of a sudden, degenerated into uh, the beginning of a civil war. And uh, when uh, uh, Kofi Annan, then just retired as uh, Secretary General, was called to intervene, uh, there were already more than 2,000 dead uh, uh, about four years ago. Uh, and um, the, uh, the only way he could resolve that question was, uh, well, peace now uh, and uh, um, intelligent order later, we let them govern together and we create uh, a government of 100, 104 cabinet ministers, world record. So everybody can eat uh, uh, and that is the price we need to pay uh, for an immediate ceasefire. It worked so far, but of course it cannot work eternally. How can you um, proceed democratically when you first have an election uh, then uh, someone has more, but the other one says, no, I have more. And the result is, well, then let's share it and let's do it all together. It's not the German Große Koalition, which sometimes happens, as you know. It's a, it's a, it's a degeneration, uh, a degeneration of uh, uh, democracy, and all Africans are aware of it. So it can only be an interim and provisional way of dealing with uh, a crisis. So uh, Kenya is, is a problem child right now. Uh, the third, and I could, of course, take others. I'm not talking about Sudan. We, we want to come to an end at some stage here. The third, um, perhaps typical problem of Africa is the DRC. Uh, typical in, in some ways, uh, because there everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And from an, a very early uh, um, uh, part of, uh, of that uh, huge territory's history. Uh, the Belgian Congo had the worst colonial regimes of, of all. The Belgians just uh, didn't know uh, uh, as much about uh, uh, governance as uh, the French and the British, both in their way, did. And uh, they did not care about education. They left the country um, in a hurry uh, with uh, 13 university graduates. One, three, 13. Seven of them were medical doctors. How can you run a country the size of uh, uh, of America from the East Coast to the Mississippi with 13 university graduates. You cannot. Uh, so uh, it was always too big. It never had any communications apart from that river. Uh, uh, and um, it had uh, no structures. Uh, still today, the educational system is very weak. Institutions are uh, not really what you would you and I would consider an institution that is working on the communal, on the regional, on the state and uh, national level. Um, there's the east-west divide. Uh, they don't understand each other. Kabila has been voted in by uh, the people from the east. Uh, distrust in him is, uh, is huge in the west. And uh, economically speaking, uh, the country has um, three ways 
to, to reach the sea, one from Kinshasa, which is the Atlantic, one from Katanga, the copper province in the south, uh, towards Durban, that is how the copper is being shipped, and Durban is really somewhere else, if you look at the map, uh, and finally, uh, uh, Mombasa, uh, which is all of eastern Congo, so all transport goes uh, to the Indian Ocean there, but in between these three, there are no communications. How can you run a country? So Congo is, once again, uh, I will not go into it further. I've spent two very interesting years there. And um, I could talk about the war, but uh, I think most of you are very well aware of this. It is um, an impossible country, and it looks as if there is no perspective. Uh, so uh, how could I pretend uh, that Africa is on the move, is on the move beyond aid, um, with, uh, uh, with such examples to which others could indeed be added. Well, I think I have to start from a completely different angle uh, in order to explain to you uh, why uh, Africa is now indeed on the rise. Um, a profound change has swept over the continent, uh, I would say, since, uh, uh, since 2000, 2005, in those past five to 12 years. Um, labor productivity has been rising. It's growing by almost 3% a year. Trade between Africa and the rest of the world has increased by 200% since 2000, from a low level, certainly, but it has increased, increased tremendously. Inflation uh, all over the continent has dropped from 22% in the 1990s to about 8% uh, in the past five years. Foreign debts declined by a quarter the debt forgiveness initiative uh, of uh, the major donors has played an important role here. Budget deficit, deficits have declined by two-thirds. Uh, in eight of the past 10 years, economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa has been faster than in East Asia. Again, from a low level, but the, the trend is impressive. At least a dozen African countries have expanded by more than 6% a year for six or more years now. And despite the current problems in the Northern Hemisphere with less demand, uh, the IMF still expects Sub-Saharan Africa's economies to expand by around 6% uh, over the next two years. Uh, several bigger countries are likely to hit growth rates of even 10%. And the World Bank, which is not known for boosterism, uh, has said in a report this year that Africa could be on the brink of an economic takeoff, much like China was 30 years ago and India 20 years ago. The World Bank has said that. Mortality rates for children over the past 20 years have dropped from 165 per 1,000 births to about 118. It's good news, of course, but it also needs to be seen in the, in the larger demographic uh, uh, context. Um, the trend is that over the next 40 years, Africa's population will double from 1 billion to 2 billion. Please think of crops, think of water. An enormous challenge. Europe's and China's population are shrinking. Uh, the US, I think, still has a small growth rate, and so has India, but uh, the biggest population growth rate on our planet is definitely in Africa. Although the majority of Africans remain below the poverty line, uh, a genuine middle class is now emerging all over the continent. I, and I don't think one can underline that, uh, um, uh, uh, one can emphasize that enough. Uh, we all know that it's middle classes that make countries prosperous, and it's middle classes that improve governance because they uh, have things to ask to their government, they have things to lose, and they therefore become politically active, uh, which is not the case uh, when you are on a subsistence level of, uh, of two dollars a day uh, in Africa. It's not, of course, in the US it wouldn't be possible, but in Africa with two dollars per day you can survive. Uh, so uh, now we have 60 million African households. I will stop the statistics in a minute because it's, it's, never, uh, it's never helpful to do that for too long. 60 million African households have annual incomes uh, that exceed $3,000 at market exchange rates. And by 2015, that's in three years, uh, this number is expected to reach 100 million. 
uh, which would be almost the same as India now. <coughs> the economies of the continent are now less dependent on the commodity prices. You will recall that the ups and downs in Africa <coughs> were always very much linked to uh, the commodity market. Uh, but infrastructure improvement has taken place in the meantime. Uh, and uh, there are other factors that uh, have lessened this dependency. Um, and one of the main factors is the mobile phone. More than 600 million Africans now have mobile phones. I will come back to that in a moment. Political stability is improving. We have less wars than in the 90s. Foreign investment is five times greater than it was a decade ago. And uh, it is now by far exceeding aid to Africa. That is why I'm asking the question of aid. Is aid really still important for Africa? We'll come to that. We have major success stories. Ghana, you all know about that. Uh, even beyond Kofi Annan, Ghana is a, a, a small lion, not a tiger in Africa. Um, Benin is a very stable country. Of course, it's small. Uh, and huge Nigeria, next door to Benin, um, has many problems and will always have an enormous amount of problems with 150 million people, um, uh, a Muslim Christian dividing line that uh, keeps us, uh, uh, um, that, that keeps uh, sort of giving <coughs> us explosive news every now and then. But Nigeria has just <coughs> had uh, its best presidential election ever. It was as correct as it could be expected. So. Uh, I would very much caution uh, 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 to, uh, to call Nigeria a basket case, which many Africans, other than Nigerians, tend to do because they very often don't like the Nigerians. They are too strong and too, sometimes too much uh, uh, preponderant and a bit bullish. But uh, uh, Nigeria needs to be watched. It is a country that is more stable today than it was five or ten years ago. Uh, and um, uh, the, the trends are very interesting there. So why has all this happened? Why do we have these trends over the past 10 years? Um, I can see six reasons, and I will go through them briefly. Uh, the first and foremost reason for me, having lived there for uh, seven out of the last eight years, is the impact of the cell phone and the internet. Africa is on the phone all the time. Uh, of course, for fun, but mainly for business. Uh, imagine. Uh, the amount of improvement a woman uh, with a small market stall uh, can uh, achieve uh, for the efficiency of her trade when she is able to make uh, cell phone contact with, uh, with her suppliers and her customers. The, the just-in-time element improves. Uh, the, the efficiency of everything she will do, and it's, it's usually the, the women who, uh, let's say, manage uh, uh, the African household by their tenacity and uh, uh, and by their uh, abstinence from, uh, from uh, certain vices that uh, uh, make the international money lenders uh, always go to women in Africa. You know that uh, the, the famous microcredit is, uh, is mostly for women um, because giving uh, the same amount of money to a man, and that I think is not uh, confined to Africa, uh, bears a much higher risk of, uh, of the liquor store being frequented uh, a minute later than it would uh, if you would give it to a woman. So uh, the, the, the African woman and the mobile phone is a fantastic story and, and to be continued. Uh, of course, you can only reach out your phone when you have power uh, and you can only access your internet account when, when you have a working server. These are challenges that uh, you very frequently experience in Africa as, as being still in the way of an efficient use of these modern uh, communication technologies. Uh, the cell phone is not only important for trade, it's also important for governance. The elections in the Congo, uh, the, the first elections, which went, went rather well, the last ones with much less international support uh, were questionable. But when Kabila was first elected and the first Congolese parliament, uh, results from polling stations were um, uh, copied there and were trans, uh, transmitted via cell phone uh, to the Central Electoral Commission. This reduces possibilities for fraud and uh, lost uh, 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 ballot boxes and, and all, uh, all the usual stuff uh, immensely. So you can improve the quality of elections uh, through the help of the mobile phone. Um, opposition and human rights work. Uh, just look at what happened in, in the north of Africa, which I'm not discussing now. I'm really focusing on 
sub-Sahara Africa. The, the Arab Spring would not have been possible uh, without modern communications, especially for the younger generation. So it's very important for the opposition that uh, the cell phone exists. The contact with the diaspora, not only for remittances, uh, the diaspora, of course, sends money, which is an important factor, but you stay in touch. You discuss with your, uh, with your uncle in America whether uh, your child will not have an education opportunity in the States. You couldn't do that before. So uh, the, the cell phone is at the beginning of Africa's uh, new rise. Um, the second of the six reasons is the, the slow but steady move towards better governance. Uh, we should not think of Africa just in terms of, of the remaining dinosaurs, uh, the six or eight 25-year-plus uh, uh, heads of state uh, who, uh, who are, uh, let's say, the, the bogeyman of the continent for everybody who, who wants to denigrate it. And uh, there, there are reasons for criticizing that, of course. Um, so civil society uh, uh, is much stronger in most African countries than it was, let's say, uh, up until, uh, until the changes in the world in the 90s when the Soviet Union went down and when the Cold War ceased to be a factor uh, in African politics. Um, one is more integrated into world trends. I already s spoke about the diaspora. Uh, there's more knowledge about uh, how one gets an election right than there was about 15 years ago. Um, there is an improving media scene. African newspapers, African radio stations are not uh, that, I would say, uh, uh, barefoot basic anymore uh, than they used to be when I first served in that continent. Uh, and uh, there, a lot of help has been given by the United States and Europe in terms of educating journalists and uh, making them aware of the possibilities they have. Um, and uh, there is, as a consequence of all this raising uh, this rising awareness, uh, uh, much more of a request for democracy and the rule of law. So uh, uh, the younger generations, the famous middle class I was talking about, uh, is not ready to, uh, to just be told by the big man uh, to shut up, not anymore. Um, we have uh, better health care, that is my next point. Better health care is, uh, is really something where uh, I think uh, uh, the West has helped, has helped enormously, but uh, uh, must be careful not just to put money in, but to let the autonomous uh, and uh, uh, local uh, um, resources uh, do the job. Uh, malaria is down. Uh, malaria nets uh, have been distributed all over the continent, thanks to Bill Gates and others. Uh, that is quite an achievement. Uh, and cheaper tests and cheaper drugs are available. Um, that was, always, uh, was not always easy, because uh, the World Health Organization uh, uh, sometimes uses the expensive drugs uh, pressed uh, by uh, pressure groups who would uh, not like to have cheap tests and cheap drugs to be distributed in Africa. Big fight. Um, HIV and AIDS uh, still is a major problem, especially in southern Africa, uh, but the new infections have gone down very much. Uh, the awareness is there. Uh, uh, the, the drugs also in this case uh, are cheaper to uh, um, uh, to, uh, to get at, and uh, I would say, although we are not, uh, certainly not over that problem yet, but uh, um, we've seen the worst of it. Um, the strong diaspora, I've already said, this is really one of the, the reasons for the new success. Uh, the remittances, the contact, the integration, the education opportunities, a diaspora, a typical uh, African diaspora is always um, uh, asking uh, themselves, is there a possibility for us to go back or is there not? Are we now better here with our children uh, in Britain uh, as a Zimbabwean nurse or a Ghanaian doctor uh, uh, in the United States because we have, uh, uh, we have obtained the green card? Well, we will stay. But the impact they have back home is enormous and uh, uh, should not be, uh, should not be uh, underestimated. Um, and as the African diasporas have increased in number and in quality, in quality of, of education um, since, I would say, 1990, uh, the, uh, the feedback to uh, uh, the African uh, motherland uh, is, uh, is uh, considerable. Um, last but one point, the new role of China, of India, of Brazil, and now even Turkey, uh, so the emerging economies of this world, um, uh, uh, there's an extraordinary figure, I think the last figure I'm giving you, 
A generation ago, Brazil, Russia, India, and China accounted for just 1% of African trade, just 1%. Most of Africa's trade went straight north with Europe. Some intra-African trade, but you all know that communications were bad and still are. So the intra-African trade still has an enormous room for improvement, but uh, that is something for, let's say, the next generation there. So these, uh, these uh, big emerging economies uh, were basically not visible in Africa. That was 30 years ago. Today they make up, they make up 20 percent uh, of uh, trade with Africa, and by 2030, if current trends can be extrapolated, that rate is expected to exceed 50 percent. So more than half of Africa's trade will be with emerging economies and Asia in particular. Um, so if China and India continue to grow, Africa will grow too. There are uh, interdependencies uh, that are considerable. And the very last reason why all this happened, I think, is the very special role of South Africa. Uh, please think back 17 years uh, when uh, apartheid ended in South Africa. Uh, at that time, uh, the country was not related to the, west of the rest of the continent. It was an outsider. Uh, it was uh, politically ostracized. Uh, and uh, trade was minimal. Um, now, uh, since, 19, for, uh, since 1994, in these 17 years, um, South Africa has not only come back into the African mainstream, but has uh, taken leaps uh, and bounds to, uh, to be um, uh, at its avant-garde. It is, uh, as many say, uh, for Africa what the United States of America are for the Americas. Now, that is a, a very, uh, I would say, it's a courageous and, and a bit risky uh, comparison. But um, uh, 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 the, the beauty of the argument lies in, uh, uh, in its being so pointed. So please watch South Africa. Uh, they have joined this group that we used to call BRIC before, uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, and China, which is now called BRICS. Uh, and um, although they may have a president who is not to everybody's liking, uh, uh, that, that is really not uh, the main issue. South Africa. Um, with intelligent government can avoid, can hopefully avoid uh, racial clashes, although they have not yet, let's say, uh, gone through all of this uh, as they have in Zimbabwe at great cost, uh, and hopefully learn from the Zimbabwean example and not make the same mistakes. Uh, South Africa is a success story because uh, the races uh, have so far managed to continue to live together. Um, uh, black, Indian, and white, uh, mainly speaking. Uh, and if that continues, uh, I would say it is a recipe for success. Uh, it, but of course, it needs to continue uh, with uh, enormous progress on the side of the ANC in terms of education, jobs, and healthcare. Uh, if that can be done, and we can only hope and pray that it will be done, that will be an enormous factor of stability, certainly for Southern Africa, but I believe for the whole of Africa. So these are the reasons I see for uh, for the developments of these uh, past uh, 10 years. This, can this still fail? Are there still risks of failure? I think there are. Um, a long-term slump in commodity prices could slow this down considerably. Uh, a long-term slump in commodity prices, I'm not uh, an economist and I'm not a businessman, is something that I don't see as very likely to happen. Uh, looking at the appetite of uh, China, India, and the other new tigers and lions, uh, the demand for commodities uh, is at least going to be stable, I believe, uh, if not increasing. So that could be, that could be a, a risk of failure. Another risk of failure is that uh, uh, there will be not enough progress with regard to corruption. Corruption, of course, is, is detrimental for every economy. And, and detrimental for uh, the morale of uh, any uh, country and society that wants to make progress. Um, corruption is not always uh, seen as, uh, 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 as it is seen in the West, in Africa. Um, awareness uh, still can be raised further as to uh, its, uh, um, its disastrous impact on progress and uh, on the quality of life. Uh, I still have a lot of question marks there from personal experience. 
new wars, of course, can happen. Uh, the United Nations are very happy to, uh, I don't know whether they're happy, but uh, they pretend to be happy to close down one peacekeeping mission after the other, or to scale down at least. Um, the amount of wars and the, the amount of war victims in Africa uh, from a peak in the late 1990s has gone down every year since, and that is now about 12 to 14 years. Um, the Sudan issue seems to have been uh, resolved, at least for the time being, in a way uh, that will not make all-out war more likely. I am very careful in my wording, and uh, I stand to be corrected, uh, uh, Donald. You have spent more time in Sudan than I have. Uh, but uh, this probably inevitable um, secession of the South, this uh, partition of uh, this huge country into uh, a more Arab and a more African uh, part uh, was uh, uh, to, be, to be projected for a long time, has now happened. And so far, uh, let's, let's touch wood, it seems to be working one way or another, somehow. So uh, new wars must be avoided. Uh, but I think uh, United Nations and the West, and hopefully also the new partners of Africa, have learned over the past 15 years how to handle conflicts in Africa. And more important, Africans themselves, I think, have gained enormous experience. And the fact that the Somali crisis is now being mainly managed by Africans themselves could be an encouraging sign. We're still waiting for the result. The jury is out. Uh, but um, I would say Western interference or international interference in resolving the Somali issue is smaller, and the Western role is, is, is much more restricted there than it was uh, in Sudan uh, and in the DRC. Uh, another risk, uh, and that is a long-standing risk, and that's a serious one, uh, are cultural obstacles. Um, Africa has division lines between the old and the young that we, we cannot even imagine. One of the reasons why Mugabe is still there is because you you do not just uh, kick the old lion and, and tell him to retire. You don't do it. It is against uh, deep, deeply rooted patterns of culture to challenge the old man. Um, well, uh, progress very often comes from the younger generation. Uh, uh, I think America knows more about that than most other parts of the world. Uh, in Africa, that uh, may be what the young middle class is thinking but it's certainly not what most regimes uh, would be ready to accept as the new thinking. So the young and the old, uh, the, the old and the young is, is a dividing line, as is the clan and the tribe. Um, we have. Uh